Heavenly Father. What a beautiful and kind God thou art. We thank you, Lord, for your desire to bring us into a holy, and higher and heavenly atmosphere. And we, Lord, I just want to thank you for the sweet and good spirit that's been here in this church throughout the Sabbath. It has really been a blessing. And I thank you for the people who have come to fellowship. I thank you for renewing within us a right spirit. And I thank you for the promise for clean and converted hearts. And that's what we really desire. And we thank you that we do have a friend in Jesus. Lord, as we continue in our final lecture that will bring us into the closing Sabbath hours, we want to once again invite the presence of your Holy Spirit. Would you please be with us to guide our minds and press our thoughts and give us a deeper understanding of the scriptures of truth. As we study history and prophecy together, we pray that you'll give us a clear understanding of the events of the third angel and that as we understand the events and the message, that we'd also have that experience of the third angel. The commandments of God in the heart, the faith of Jesus. So please bless us, pour your spirit out upon us, and please fill this place with holy angels once again, we pray. And may this uh, Sabbath day be crowned with your blessings and goodness. May your paths drop fatness. We thank you for hearing these prayers, and we thank you in advance for the blessing on the scriptures. For we pray in the worthy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The direction of uh, the amount of information that uh, I've tried to squeeze into these talks has been uh, longer than I anticipated or desired at first. So we are on uh, part three now of the events, the, the delineation of events. Last night we spoke about the message and the experience, and this morning and for uh, the main service on the Sabbath, we've been speaking about the events of the third angel, and we're going to try to conclude that talk right now, and by God's grace, tomorrow morning, we have two talks. We'll be speaking about the locusts, the king of the north, and the glorious land. We'll be speaking about that uh, tomorrow morning, as well as Josiah and his revival and reformation, and how that also typified Daniel 11, 40-45, the closing verses. It was a type of of the third angel. So we'll be dealing with that tomorrow morning. Uh, I hope and pray that those of you who have uh, been listening, whether here or online, that you've been able to receive a blessing and learn something by God's grace. I'm going to try to slow down a little bit. I know that I tend to speak quite fast, especially when I feel pressured by time and I'm trying to cram more information in. I just kind of come to the conclusion that it, I just did not get what I wanted to get done today. So it's all right. We'll finish it tomorrow. Amen. So I might as well just slow down a little bit and try to finish this last talk up so you can follow along with me. Are we ready? Amen. We've been dealing with uh, history repeated, Millerite history repeated. This is uh, what's called by some uh, a, re a reform line, um, showing the Reformation, showing many d different similarities. Um, I think that there can be an extreme um, in some circles where they emphasize this so much that uh, can kind of make it a uh, reform line, say just about anything they wanted to. But I do believe that there's some basic uh, history that is repeated. I do believe that there are some basic principles, especially within this history, because as we read earlier, we're told that the parable of the ten virgins, remember that quote? Great Controversy, page 3, 
93, the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 illustrates the experience of which people? The Adventist people. And then we're told in Review and Herald, August 19, 1890, paragraph 3, that I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom are wise and five foolish. This parable has been fulfilled, past, and will be future fulfilled to the very letter. For it has a special application to this time, and like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth until the close of time. So we're told that the parable of the ten virgins is present truth. And it's to last until the end of time. And it illustrates something specific. It illustrates our history and how our history is going to be repeated to the very letter. Amen? So when we look at these general way marks in history, we found out that the parable of the ten virgins that has been or was fulfilled in the past was fulfilled in our past history between 1798 and 1844. That was the history of early Adventism, which we call Millerite history. Amen? And you're all still... You're all with me, at least on that point, are you not? And all this history that I just shared with you is nothing strange, nothing new. This is basic history. Any Adventist history book, you're going to find this as well. So 1798, we found the time of the end, this three-way power struggle between the papacy, the United States, and atheism. The papacy received a deadly wound. It was going down. There was an increase of knowledge. The prophecy that was unsealed in the time of the Millerites was Daniel 8.14, Right? Then we have William Miller who came on the scene. He was converted in 1816. He starts his Bible study in 1819, begins to publicly preach in 1831. 1833, he now has the official sanction and license of his church. The stars fall from heaven, November 13th. And there's a great impetus now, uh, or rather a great uh, interest rather, awakened in William Miller's end-time apocalyptic prophecies. August 11th, 1840, there was a prediction about the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the Islamic Empire. And who do you remember? Uh, who was the man that predicted that? Josiah Litch. And he, just, he predicted that in 1838, we're told, in the book Great Controversy, page 331, 332. And he says, uh, it was a one, it was a, she says it was a remarkable fulfillment of prophecy that took place. And so imagine being able to predict the very day and year that a major world empire is going to collapse. Okay? And we know that uh, the Turkish Empire did not completely dis disappear, but it did lose its sovereignty when it accepted the allied powers of Europe, which at that time was England, Austria, Russia, and Prussia. And so they accepted their protection of, uh, of power. Then we have in 1842, in May, the chart is published. It's this one right here, 1843 chart. And this helped to somewhat clarify what the united faith of the early Adventists were or was. Uh, the, what the Millerites preached in the first and second angel's message. All of the, his, the message was based upon time. After 1844, it's based on events, no longer time. We can no longer predict things to the very day and hour because time is no longer. Uh, that means prophetic time is no longer. Amen. And some of you will remember Revelation 10 when the mighty angel stood up and said there's time no longer that's dealing with time prophecy. So there's no, lo there's no more any type of future application of time prophecy. So that means we can't take 1260 and reapply it and say there'll be a literal three and a half years of papal reign or et cetera. Does that make sense? Okay, all the time prophecies have been fulfilled by the year 1844. But then June of 1842, the uh, Protestants begin to reject uh, the Millerites. They're starting to shut their doors upon them. And then finally, April 17th, 1844, they suffered what? What happened April 17th? Remember, they were waiting for Jesus to come and in the Jewish year, 1843, and the Jewish year went from the spring to the spring. So by the spring of 1844, they suffered a what? The first disappointment when Jesus did not come, right? And then from that point, that's the parable of the ten virgins. The bridegroom did not come. The bridegroom tarried. So they found out that now from this point in time, they are in a tarrying time. Got it? They're in a tarrying time, and they go back and reexamine their positions. They discovered that the 2,300-day prophecy that began in 457 B.C. that did not go into effect until the autumn of 18, uh, 457, therefore would not be completely fulfilled until the autumn of 1844. Samuel Snow begins to study this whole principle out. He finds out that the cleansing of the sanctuary and the Jewish cycle took place on the 10th day of the seventh month. He was studying the Jewish feast days, kind of like we just did. And he found out that, well, Jesus died on the very day of Passover. He was buried on the very day of unleavened bread. He resurrected on the very day of first fruits. So why would he not also, 
the cleansing of the sanctuary take place on the very day. So the tenth day of the seventh month, according to Karaite Jewish reckoning, will be on October 22nd of that year. You got it? And this became known as the, the, uh, as the seventh month movement. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Just a few more weeks. And at the camp meeting at Exeter on August 12th through 17th, the midnight cry. He actually first preached that in July, by the way. It's a whole different topic. But in the summer, in the summer of 1844, the second angel's message is now being preached. And what does the second angel's message say? The second angel's message, Revelation 14, verse 8. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, right? And Charles Fitch, which who, was, who was a very prominent Millerite, worked along with William Miller, he began to preach that message, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, and he began to say, come out of her, my people. And so people began to come out of Babylon. Now, back then in the 1800s, who was Babylon? The Protestant churches that had kept the Catholic doctrine. These are the daughters of Babylon, right? So because Babylon had already been in a fallen condition prior to that, and it was fallen for many years, and there was a deadly wound in 1798. So Babylon were the daughters of Babylon, dealing with the fall, a fallen of Protestant churches during that time. So the second angel's message comes into history in its empowerment during the midnight cry. And at the midnight cry, what happens to the virgins? We read in Matthew 25. What do they do? They awake, and they trim their lamps, and... All of a sudden, some find out that they have oil, other ones don't, and then there's a what? There's a shut door. And the shut door takes place October 22nd, 1844, when Jesus rises up. And remember, he opens the doors and he shuts doors and no man can open. Remember the message to the Philadelphians? And so he shuts the door to the holy and opens the door to the most holy, and this is now fulfilled. The sanctuary begins to be cleansed, Daniel 8, 14. The Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days. He comes to His temple, Malachi 3.1, and the bridegroom comes and shuts the door, Matthew 25. Remember Ellen White said that all these scriptures are describing the same event? Are you all with me still? Okay, good. All this history, Mrs. White says, has been fulfilled and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has a special application to this time, and it will continue to be present true through the close of time. So what we're going to study now very, uh, as briefly as we can, we're going to look at this line here in our history, how that parallels this history up here, okay? Let's go ahead and look at that. And then what I want to do is also uh, show something else before I close. So we look at the time of the end. Okay, the time of the end. Boy, I, this, is, this, this could really take about a week to study. But um, I'm, going to, I'm going to throw out a lot of things out there and ask you to assume them um, while we're studying. And then, of course, it invites you to go back and study more deeply on your own. When you go to Dan Let's go to Daniel chapter 11 very quickly. Daniel chapter 11. And let's look at a few things here about the time of the end. Daniel chapter 11. Let's go back to verse 40, the time of the end. And uh, when you have that, please just let me know by saying amen. And the Bible says... And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push, that word push means make war against him. Now the context, the context is the king of the north, okay? There's a war between the king of the north and the king of the south. Now all of us already studied and agreed uh, that the time of the end was described in the year of 1798, right? After the time, times, and half a time. You can also read about that in Daniel 11 and verses 30 through 35 which you can do on your own time, dealing with the abomination of desolation, the king of the north, persecuting people. Some would fall by the sword, by captivity, by flame for many days until the time appointed, the time of the end, until 1798. So in 1798, the time of the end, the king of the south would make war against the king of the north. Now, who was the king of the north in 1798? The papacy, all right? The ancient king of the north was the king of Assyria and the king of Babylon, then here, who is this king of the south? Now, anciently, used to be the king of Egypt. So who, what power, even before we start interpreting prophecy, let, let's, I mean, just history, what power actually gave the deadly wound to the papacy in 1798? Atheistic France. So just based on history, we know that France has to be the king of the south. That, just, just by history, because that's, that's the only power that gave the deadly wound to the papacy, Right? Now, you can prove that later on. How many by a show of hands have ever read the book Great Controversy? Show of hands. Yeah? Okay. So you know then that there's a chapter in there entitled 
the reign of terror. Right? And what is that chapter dealing with? What power is Mrs. White talking about in the chapter called the reign of terror? They're all like, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to get it wrong. What was it? Papal Romy says, the reign of terror. That's why you're all mumbling. What was it? France. Dealing with the French Revolution. Okay? So the chapter called the reign of terror was dealing with the French Revolution of 1793. Okay? Between 1793 and 1797. And in that chapter, she starts off by quoting... Revelation chapter 11. It's very interesting. And Ellen White, who I believe had the gift of the inspiration, I believe that she had the gift of being a prophet, she directly ties in Revelation 11 to atheistic France. Now go there very quickly. Go to Revelation 11. Now if we had a long time together, we'd go ahead and just read the whole chapter together. But you can go do that on your own, right? So I'm just giving you a bunch of notes. Do you guys go back and actually study your notes? All right, good. Do you actually go share your notes? You know, there's a little secret. A lot of people ask me, I've had people ask me over the years, you know, how do you remember all this stuff? It's like, where'd you go to school? It's like, I, well, I graduated from Penn State. So. You all got that, didn't you? No, not Pennsylvania. Like, Penn State, like State Penn, yeah. And so I don't have any uh, any kind of higher qualities than any of you, all right? My mind was just about blown on drugs when I was youth. I got kicked out of school after my ninth, my ninth year in uh, school, so I only finished ninth grade. Um, so how do I know all this stuff? Well, because uh, I had plenty of time to study. Well, I did have quite a bit of time to study, that's right. You know, you're in your cell 23 hours a day, you got a lot of time to study and pray, don't you? But that's not why. The reason why is because, number one, I asked God to restore my brain because I had lost a lot of brain cells. You know, speaking, smoking PCP uh, kills your brain cells pretty quick. And so, number one, I had to ask the Lord to help to, help to clean up my slurring because I cooked my brain cells too much and asked the Lord to heal my brain and make my brain like a sponge so I could just kind of absorb these things. But here's the secret. I'll give you a little secret. You ready for it? Okay. When you hear something, you know, faith comes by hearing hearing by the Word of God, when you hear something, you remember only a certain portion of it. You know that, don't you? I get it all the time on Sabbath. Pastor, that was a powerful sermon. Really? What'd you learn? I, yeah, don't, hey man. You never had that happen before? I asked the youth, like, what'd you learn from Sabbath school? I don't know. I don't remember. Right? So you only remember a certain portion of what you hear. But when you hear it and you see it, a lot of times that's why I draw on these boards when you, because it's, it's affecting different portions of your brain. So when you hear it and you see it, you remember more. But then when you hear it and you see it and you also write it, you remember more. This is just scientific. That's why I asked you to get your notes. Write it down. Open your Bible. Okay. But when you hear it, you see it, you write it, and then you share it, you'll never forget it. Because in order to share it with somebody else, you have to make it your own first. Are you all with me, friends? I get that a lot of time. Well, Pastor, I don't know where to start. I don't know how to share. Well, any of you, how many of you know that the Sabbath is the seventh day? Anyone know that? Well, you're all here for a reason. You know that, right? Share that with somebody. So as you start sharing the little stuff that you know, what happens is God will help you to grow more and more. You increase your capacity to learn as you share. As you give, you receive. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over is poured into your lap and your bosom. So if you want to be able to be a strong Bible teacher, how, or uh, or strong Bible, a strong Bible student becomes a strong Bible teacher by sharing with other people. So get out there and share it with somebody else. Amen? And by the way, I'll just, I'll just say that one more time. This whole devilish doctrine that we shouldn't be doing evangelism is straight from the pits of hell, brothers and sisters, because Jesus never repealed the Great Commission. We are supposed to be reaching out to souls. God has never shut off the evangelism button. All right? So people that say that stuff based upon their own authority, not the authority of the Bible or the spirit of prophecy, I reject any man that contradicts God's word. So we have to be out, get, able to get out there and share in the capacity that you have. And that is not a self-generated work. That is doing the work that God called us to. It's the work of sanctification, of cooperating with God and planting seeds that can spring up under the loud cry 
and the latter rain. Amen? All right. So, where were we? Thank you, Revelation 11. Revelation 11, Mrs. White links that directly to the French Revolution of 1793. Now, we're going to just kind of pass over this very quickly, but uh, let's just look at a few uh, scriptures. Let's go to verse 2 very quickly. When you're there, amen. Revelation 11, verse 2. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city, Jerusalem that is, speaking of the church, shall they tread underfoot for how long? 42 months. So God's church, his city, Jerusalem, is a symbol of the church, God's people. It's being trampled upon, persecuted for 42 months. Now, what is 42 months? Here's a cheat sheet up here. 42 months is also, that's three and a half years. That's also 1,260 days. So what time period was the church being trampled underfoot, tread down by from 538 to 1798? Good. Next verse. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. Who are the two witnesses? Old and New Testament, the law and the prophets symbolized by Moses and Elijah in this, in this chapter. And they prophesy in 1,203 score days clothed in sackcloth. That's in obscurity, darkness, mourning. So for a, over 1,000 years, the Bible's been trampled upon by Rome, right? Now let's drop down here to verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast, what's a beast symbolize? A kingdom that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them. War against who? War against the, wit the two witnesses. Who's the two witnesses? The Word of God. So there's a kingdom that shall rise up sometime after or near the end of the 1260 years, it will rise up and make open war against the Word of God. Are you with me? And shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called what? Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And that would take place for, verse 9, three and a half days. Now, what does a day symbolize in Scripture? Years. So for three and a half years, the Word of God would seem killed dead by this kingdom that was spiritually like Sodom, it was licentious, and like Egypt. And Mrs. White brings out that Pharaoh was an atheist. When he said, who is God? Who is Jehovah? I know not Jehovah, neither will I let God's people go. You all have all read that before, haven't you? She used the revived version when she quotes that. So for three and a half years, the word of God was killed dead in this, by this kingdom. And this is in the chapter called the French Revolution, the Reign of Terror. All right. If you want the dates for that, that was November 10th, 1793 to June 17th, 1797. I'll say it one more time. November 10th, 1793. That was when the French Parliament outlawed the Word of God. They outlawed marriage. They outlawed anything of a Christian institution. They also outlawed the seven-day work week. Did you know that? And it was made a 10-day work week. I actually have a book by a historian of, on the French Revolution that actually gives you all the different days uh, that they worked, the, the days and the names of the days. So, November 10th, 1793 to June 17th, 1797, and that was when the atheistic revolution of France outlawed and killed the Word of God. Now, Sodom symbolizes licentiousness, does it not? Sodom was very well known for its homosexuality and so forth, and that's exactly what happened in France, was it not? You know that here in America, we still uh, celebrate a French day of decadence and licentiousness and homosexuality down in the French quarters of New Orleans. It's called Mardi Gras. If you want to know what the French Revolution was like, go down to Bourbon Street on Mardi Gras. And that's how they were acting over there, friends. All right? <clears throat> you know, what's crazy about that. Now we're having this stuff all over America, aren't we? Okay. Now, what was Egypt known for? Atheism. But you know what's kind of funny about atheists? I'll just throw this out there. Uh, Pharaoh was an atheist, right? He denied the existence of God, but he worshipped nature. Did he not? All the plagues was a direct judgment upon his religion of what he was worshipping. He worshipped the river Nile. He worshipped the frogs. He worshipped nature. It was kind of funny today. We call these atheists who worship nature, we call them evolutionists. They deny the existence of God, but they love to worship the creative powers of the bug and the moth and the monkey and the rhinoceros. You all know what I'm talking about, don't you? And you watch all these silly things on PBS, you know, millions of years ago, you know, the creative powers of nature, and they have all this, you know, silly English accents and so forth. 
You know what I'm talking about. I'm not trying to be silly. I'm just saying it's ridiculous. So, you know, it takes more faith. I'm kind of going off on a tangent. I won't go too far. Don't worry. But it's really, it's really, it actually takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in God. You know that, don't you? There's way more scientific evidence that evolution is impossible. I mean, science even knows a stellar evolution is impossible. Macro evolution is impossible. They never found a missing link. The fossil record, the geologic structure, nothing supports macro evolution at all. The only portion what we call evolution or evolving, the only thing that's supported scientifically is what we call microevolution or adaptation. That means that a bug or a bird might get a bigger beak uh, from a different generation, but it's still a bird. It doesn't become a lizard. Are you with me, friends? So this whole thing that men came from monkeys and monkeys came from lizards and lizards came from fish and fish came from the swamp and the swamp came from a rock and the rock came from rain and the rain came from the clouds and clouds came from nothing. So nothing came, nothing blew up. Nothing blew up one day and became everything we see. That takes a whole lot of faith, brothers and sisters. I'd rather, if I'm going to believe that nothing blew up, might as well say that God said, be there, bang, and then it happened. That's the big bang. All right. So Sodom and Egypt, Egypt were atheists. This is the French Revolution. That was the king of the south. Are you all with me, friends? So that's my point. So when you come back to Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, the king of the north, ancient Babylon, the king of the south, ancient Egypt. So spiritual Egypt was France that gave the deadly wound of the papacy in 1798. Did everyone get that? All right, amen. Go back to Daniel 11 now. Let's, let's move on. Otherwise, I'll, we'll be here for another week. Am I going slow enough, brother? My brother, he's older, Elder Ingram was whispering to me saying, slow down. I'm trying. I really am. Believe it or not, brothers and sisters, I'm a whole lot slower than I used to be. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. All right. Oh, no, no. No, no need to apologize. I, I'm working on it. Maybe another 40 years, I'll be slow enough, you can all understand me. <laughs> Verse 40, and at the time of the end, what year? 7098. Shall the king of the south, the king of Egypt, what power is that? Atheistic friends. Shall push or make war against him that was the king of the north, and who's that? The papacy. Fulfilled. Got it? History and prophecy go together. Now, the second half of that verse... Notice what happens. The king of the north, that's the papacy, comes back against the south like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen. That's, that's, that's a symbol of military power. I mean, that's what they use, chariots and horsemen. They use it for military. And with many ships, they traded by sea. You can read that in Revelation 18, Ezekiel 27. And he, the papacy, shall enter into the countries. Oh, excuse me, I'm in verse 4. Yeah, the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So when did the papacy... This is now the second half. When did the papacy come back against the king of the south or against atheism and overthrow many atheistic countries? That brings us now down to our day and time. 1989. That's exactly right. History and prophecy go together. I've been to, uh, been to Germany a number of times, been to uh, Romania and the Czech Republic, been to the former Soviet Union, and uh, everyone knows that. November 1989, the Berlin Wall collapses, right? In, uh, in which separated Eastern and Western Germany. Uh, December 25th, 1989, uh, 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 Nikolai Ceausescu uh, is assassinated in uh, Romania. Um, that's when uh, Gorbachev also goes to meet Pope John Paul II in 1989. And uh, so you have the Soviet Union starting to collapse. So here we have the papacy beginning to rise, and you have these same powers. You have atheism back here in history, and you have the United States of America back in history because it was actually the USA cooperating with the papacy that helped to overthrow communism. You all know that, don't you? It was a Protestant president, Ronald Reagan, and it was the, the yeah, exactly the unholy alliance. Time magazine, Time magazine, December of 1990 came out saying, 1991 rather, holy alliance, how Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II conspired to help to uh, strengthen Poland's solidarity movement and help to uh, hasten the demise of communism. So here you now have now the modern day time of the end where the two beasts of Revelation 13 are starting to work together. The first beast, the papacy, and the second beast that back in 1798 was rising up like a lamb 
and now is becoming more like a dragon. Are you all with me? So here we have the modern day fulfillment of what's taking place, bringing us to the time of the end. Now, I already quoted for you volume 9, page 14, which portion of Daniel is revealed in our history? Daniel 11, remember that? We are living, matter of fact, let me read it for you. This is why it says this, volume 9, page 14. We are living in the time of the end. The 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. Did you get that? She just said we're living in what time? Time of the end. What chapter is almost fulfilled? Daniel chapter 11. And soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. Well, the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies is Daniel 12 verse 1 when Michael stands up and there's a time of trouble such as never was. That's the seven last plagues. And then many that sleep in the dust shall arrive. That's the, that's the, that's the special resurrection. So with Daniel 12 verse 1, that's the end of the world. You got it, friends? Time of trouble such as never was, a resurrection is taking place, and that's it. So if Mrs. White says that we're living in the last portion of Daniel 11, just prior to the scenes of trouble taking place, we have to be in the final verses of Daniel 11 from the time of the end down. You got it? That's verses 40 through 45. Pretty simple, isn't it? So this is what is the message that was unsealed. It's the message of the third angel, the message about the beast, the mark of the beast, the image of the beast, and the final rise and fall of the king of the north, the Pope of Rome. Are you all with me, friends? All right. Now, let's see how it parallels, because it's kind of interesting. In this history, in early Adventism, we have this three powers. We have the papacy, atheism, the United States. In our history, it's being repeated to the very letter, don't we? We once again have the papacy, atheism, that's the Soviet Union back then, and we also have the United States, we have an unsealing of the book of Daniel. We have the unsealing of the book of Daniel. Here is chapter 8. Here is chapter 11. Here we have also a prophecy regarding Islam. Islam is, is falling right there. It's kind of interesting. A little mirror here. Papacy goes down here. Papacy comes up there. Islam is losing power. Islam is, uh, if you haven't been watching the news, brothers and sisters, they're chopping people's heads off all the time. You, you, you want to know what this first and second what was like? I believe it was like ISIS. You've been hearing about ISIS, haven't you? You know they just chopped off another man's head today, right? So I just got a little, a little. I got this little Fox News app on my phone. I was over there at lunch. Something little popped up. Bloop! It said second Japanese hostage was just beheaded by ISIS. They're just, they're just sawing people's heads off. And it's not even in a nice way. It's not even like with you know samurai. It's just like with butch, you know, with kitchen knives and stuff. It's, just, it's horrible, brothers and sisters. And you know they're crucifying people and doing things like that. You can actually, I don't recommend watching those things, but you can actually get, get uh, you know, with the, the digital media, you can actually see that stuff. They're crucifying people. Uh, they're just, it's, it's absolutely horrid. So if you want to know, uh, if you don't think Islam's back on the rise, you are living in a bubble because we're, uh, brothers and sisters, we're living in some serious, serious times. Now, when did Islam start rising back up in the minds of almost everyone I talk to in the world, they, they can point to a specific day when a whole world woke up and said, man, we got a problem with radical Islam. Now, regardless of what you believe about those buildings and whatever else, I know what I believe about the buildings. I believe that some planes flew in those buildings. I don't know what happened. If there was, you know, people say there's explosives. Brothers and sisters, I believe that God brought those buildings down. That's what Ellen White says. She says that the Lord turned and overturned one touch of His mighty power and these mighty structures would fall. It was a judgment upon the wicked world trade. And But either way, September 11, 2001, the whole world woke up and said, man, we got some stuff going on with Islam. Yes or no? I've been to about 22 countries now. I think about 22. And you know what's funny is that I can go anywhere in the world. I can go off in the... The, well, most parts of Africa, some, some places are pretty remote where they don't, have, you know, don't know a whole lot. But I'm, I'm surprised at how remote I can go, India, Africa, other places. And they all know about 9-11. And almost everyone I talk to knows exactly what they were doing on that day. Does everyone here remember what you were doing on September 11, 2001? Isn't that amazing? So think about how September 11, 2001 connects with the consciousness of most human beings on planet Earth today. That was that big of an event. 
And so it's interesting. We talked about the first and second well, right? Remember that? The first well was 150 years, July 27, 1299, down to July 27, 1449. Islam attacks Eastern Rome, Constantinople. Second well, July 27, 1449 to August 11, 1840. Islam attacks Western Rome, the papacy is attacking it. You know that, don't you? You know anything about history, don't you? Well, there's three woes. One woe, two woes, three woes. Remember all these patterns we talked about? A lot of triple applications. You know, three different Romes. You know, pagan Rome, papal Rome, worldwide Rome. First woe, Islam. Second woe, Islam. What do you think the third woe is going to be? And so we enter into the third woe of Bible prophecy, September 11, 2001, which is connected with the final crisis with Islam. And friends, guess what? Listen to what I'm saying. I'm going to tell you very plainly. Based upon the word of the Lord, Based upon, these, based upon these principles and these scriptures, you can show that this problem with Islam is not going to go away. It's going to increase worse and worse and worse and worse until Jesus comes. Matter of fact, the problem with Islam is going to bring on the final world cataclysm. And I'll talk about that tomorrow. Matter of fact, the problems with Islam and attacks in the United States, which haven't happened yet, are going to bring on a national Sunday law. And it's going to bring on a new world order. Let me just show that to you very quickly, just one scripture. Genesis chapter 16. Where are we going to? Genesis 16. Let me just show this to you. When you come back tomorrow morning, we'll show you more from the scriptures when we talk about the locusts, the king of the north, and the glorious land. Amen? Genesis chapter 16. Now, this is the prophecy of Ishmael. Who was Ishmael? He was Abraham's firstborn son through a concubine named Hagar, right? He was not the child of promise. Isaac was a child of promise. But uh, Ishmael was still uh, blessed simply because he was Abraham's son. And the Lord promised to make him a mighty nation of people. Twelve tribes Ishmael had. And Genesis 16, verse 11 and 12, the angel of the Lord, who I believe in this context is actually Jesus, gives a prophecy of what's going to happen with Ishmael and his descendants. Okay, this is a long-ranging prophecy. This is called the law of first mention in the Bible. When something's first mentioned, it tells you the whole story. And the angel of the Lord, Genesis 16, verse 11. Are we there, amen? And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. He will be a very gentle man. I always say that because I want to catch people. Make sure you're paying attention. What does the angel of the Lord predict about Ishmael? He'll be a wild man. His hand will be against how many men? Every man. Now, let's, let's, let's give an honest witness. Do we see this with radical Islam? Is there hand against every man? I'm talking about every man, even including other Muslims. They will kill each other. When they're done killing each other, kill everybody else. It is an uncontrollable issue going on. You know, you understand that, friends. This is this is this is hell on earth when you see this stuff. This is this is insanity. Now, these, these people are they need Jesus, of course. But this is an absolute insanity what's going on. And he will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand will be what? Against now when it says every man, what does that mean? Every man, it means the whole world. The whole world is going to join hands to fight against Ishmael. Now, Ellen White gives a very interesting prediction. She says, she said this a uh, hundred years ago, or, oh, not, no, pardon me, not quite a hundred years ago, I guess, because that would have been, yeah, more than a hundred years ago. She said this back in the uh, late 1800s. She predicted that the Protestants of the United States would be foremost in reaching across the Gulf to grasp the hand of Romanism, they would reach across the abyss to grasp the hand of spiritualism. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country would follow in the footsteps of Rome in repudiating every principle of our Constitution as a Republican Protestant nation, et cetera, et cetera. All right, you've all heard that before, haven't you? So she's predicting that there's going to be a joining of hands by this threefold power the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, the whole world, the ten kings, will all join together and join hands. Why are they going to join hands? In order to fight against radical Islam, Ishmael. Do we see that happening today? 
Do we see the United Nations? Do we see joint bombing campaigns? Do we see the whole world coming together and say, do we have to deal with the issue of Ishmael? You know why they can't stop him? You know why they can't stop him? Number one, they have an insane, insane ideology. But they also have a whole lot of money because they're, they're controlling oil-producing countries. And once ISIS controls, you know that the ISIS controls now a third of Iraq and Syria combined. Did you know that? ISIS controls a third of both countries combined. And now they're going into Afghanistan and into Pakistan. And they're spreading and spreading and spreading. I'm just wondering if this is really truly the fulfillment, full fulfillment of the third world. I'm really just interested in this a lot. And every piece of ground that they capture, they're capturing oil fields and military, and they have tanks and they have planes now. They have all sorts of stuff. You know, did you know that? You know that ISIS now has military planes. Not just tanks and anti-aircraft aircraft. They actually have F-16s and stuff that they're flying now. Because the more that they're, they're actually capturing whole military bases. And when they capture whole military, oil, or excuse me, industrial oil fields, they're now producing oil themselves and they're selling it on the black market and they're bringing in billions and billions of dollars. So they're funding a growing military apparatus. And people are joining it from all over the world. Even the USA. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, every man's against, hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. So friends, what I'm trying to share with you, and I'll share with you more tomorrow, is that the problem is, of Islam is not going away. Matter of fact, it's about to knock on your doorstep pretty soon. And that's what I'm going to share with you tomorrow, by God's grace from the Bible, that we can expect to see the locusts come into the glorious land. And when you see that, brothers and sisters, you're going to see some chaos. And then people asking for... Sunday laws to get back to God. So you'll see that pretty soon. When? I don't know. I think the Lord is still holding the winds of strife. Brothers and sisters, he's already pulling them back from some countries. You've been heard about what happened in France just recently? And what's happened in other places? You're going to see that more and more and more. All right. So that's where we're at. Can you see a parallel? By the way, let me write something on the board, make it make more sense. This, this has really been helpful for some people. Islam, well, I'll share more tomorrow. Uh, maybe I should do it tomorrow. Huh? Want me to just plant a seed at least? Is that all right? Okay. Let me at least just uh, plant a seed. I'll, I'll share more tomorrow about this, but this has been helpful for people who have struggled to see, well, why does Islam have to rise up? What, what's the whole purpose of it? Islam in prophecy has a twofold purpose, and I'll share more tomorrow by God's grace. Twofold purpose. Number one, prophetically and historically, Islam is used to do two things to attack or to scourge the papacy, the false people, and by default, they end up protecting God's people that are receiving the seal. You can read about that in Revelation 9.4. Only hurt those that do not have the seal of God, we're told. Okay? So scores the papacy and protect God's people. And they say, well, what is Islam doing? How are they protecting God's people? Because they're not focused on you. They're focused on dominating the world and killing the Catholics and so forth. Now, right now, they're killing the other Muslims. But there's something about them in their psyche. They hate Rome. Okay, this, that's what they're raised up. They're, they're raised up to actually destroy the papacy. You know, there's actually one sect of God's people um, that they actually respect. There's one... Uh, Christian denomination that has very similar principles to Muslims. It's supposed to be Seventh-day Adventists, right? But if you think about it, we're also children of Abraham because we keep the Sabbath of Abraham. Okay, when you keep Sunday, they, they think that you're a Catholic. Okay? So we worship the God of Abraham. We keep the laws of Abraham in keeping the Sabbath. We don't eat pork. We don't drink alcohol, we don't smoke, and we're supposed to, ladies, dry, dress modestly. That's exactly right. Pastor, just put it out there. Just, ladies, put some clothes on. And men, too, as well. No, they can't. And the, re and the reason why is because, that's exactly right, and the reason why is because the Muslim mindset, um, they're very modest. That's part, that's why the women cover their heads and they cover their entire bodies. Um, of course, they can go to extremes, and also they have the burqas with only the eyes, but not all Muslims believe that uh, or interpret it that way. 
um, but they are very modest. Um, and so when they look at the Western cultures and they look at how our women dress and expose themselves and men love it all as well, uh, they think that we're a very, and they're right, we are a very debased, um, demoralized society. We're a very debased culture. We're a very licentious and very sexual culture, a very sensual culture. Are we not? Yeah. I mean, think about that, friends. Uh, you know, you can go Western Europe uh, and all throughout America, all the Western cultures, you can have billboards of naked people. You have women in bikinis. You have them kissing and making out on the billboards and television. There's sex going on. This is filthiness, brothers and sisters, in their minds. We're just used to it now, aren't we? Matter of fact, some of us are probably watching that garbage, aren't you? Thinking that God doesn't see you. <clears throat> I'm not joking. So they hate Rome. So, friends, if you look like Rome, you better watch out. But if you're a child of God preparing for the seal of God, then you have nothing to worry about. They're not there to attack you. Now, let me just show this to you very quickly. So notice that the papacy and Islam rise and fall together. Because Islam is only there in the Bible. It's only risen up by God as a scourge against Rome. So if you see Rome rise, you'll see Islam rise to fight it. Rome falls, then Islam's going to fall because there's no more purpose for it. Are you with me? So help me out now. What year... Does the papacy rise in Bible prophecy? You're all quiet. Are you all asleep? Come on now. Five thirty eight, correct. Five thirty eight A.D. We had the rise of the papacy politically. Yes or no? Yes. When does Islam rise up? You know, right here. You don't. Have, it's all right here on the chart. Matter of fact, notice this. Is this in the way? Look at this. It says six oh six. I'm actually reading. I'm reading right off the chart. Six oh six. Rise of Mohammedanism. This power stood not up against the prince of princes because it did not exist until this period. But six oh six. The rise of Mohammedanism. Uh, some people put 612, other ones will put 622. But the point is, between 606 and 622, you have the rise and teachings of Muhammad and the uniting of the Arab tribes. Are you all with me? So between 606, 622, you have the rise of Arabic Islam, the Saracens. Now, when does the papacy go down? When do they lose their political power? So 1798, the papacy goes down. So question, if Islam is really only used for two purposes, to scourge the papacy and protect God's people, if the papacy loses its power in 1798, is there any more need for political Islam? No. So when does Islam go down? Politically. 1840. August 11th. You get it? When does the time of the end come when the papacy starts to rise back up in worldwide prominence? When American president assigns an ambassador to the Vatican and works with the papacy to get it back in the world consciousness again. What year? Between 1984 and 1989. So 1989 now, we have the papacy back on the rise. So what should you expect to come back up in history to put a check on it? In 2001. You get it? Does that, does that make it a little bit easier to illustrate? So that's where we're at. After September 11, 2001, by the way, you know it's interesting. Well, I, I can do this later on, but I'll just plant a seed at least because we don't have so much time. But all the pioneers believe that on August 11, 1840, the mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down to empower the message of the little book, which is interesting because we're expecting another mighty angel to come down as well the mighty angel of Revelation 18, that's the fourth angel. And what that means is that it begins the beginning of the latter rain. Now, the latter rain is not completely poured out until the loud cry. 
And what that means, we come into a sprinkling time where the Lord wants to start cleaning us up, sealing up his people to get prepared for the Sunday law crisis. And I'll leave it at that for now. The chart was published in June of 18, uh, excuse me, uh, May of 1842. Today we see them also once again. People are going back to the old paths, going back to the foundations of the Adventist faith as well, going back and studying these things. How many, how many of you, uh, by a show of hands, have, have seen these before? These, these prophet charts. Everyone has seen them before? Do you all have copies of them? Yeah? Not everybody? Some say yes, some say no. I would really encourage you to get copies if you don't have them. Because if you ever want, anyone ever, I, I don't know about you, I was not raised a Seventh-day Adventist. How many of you were raised Seventh-day Adventists? How many of you were not raised? In all the, about half and half, right? Well, I don't know about you, but when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, um, I want to know what I believe. A lot of people raised Adventists don't really think that way. Because they already think, like, well, I was kind of, I was born Adventist. No, you weren't. You were born a sinner. You had to become an Adventist, okay? You had to be baptized to be a Christian, right? God doesn't have any grandchildren. You're not going to church, you know, to heaven just because... Lord, I have a past. My, my parents were faithful. So he doesn't have any grandchildren, all right? He, he has only children. You have to be adopted by the king yourself. Amen? All right, born again. And so I've noticed, I've noticed that, though. And I, I, matter of fact, I was talking to some uh, young people, uh, uh, some of these young people uh, over lunch. And I praise the Lord because uh, a lot of you have been like, wow, man, this, is, this is really interesting. I've been, a matter of fact, one, young, one of the young men was, I was, I've been Adventist all my life, but I've never really heard this stuff before. It's just really good. I, and now I'm learning who I am, like who, what my history is. You know, there's something grounding about that, isn't it? There's something grounding about knowing who you are. I remember when I was growing up, I didn't have a father. And I'm not going to go off on a tangent, but, you know, I was raised, which is a single mother. And uh, growing up, I always wished I knew who my father was because I was wondering who I was. You see what I'm saying? For years and years, I was like, well, I wonder who my father is. And I remember um, after I became a Christian, when I was 21 years old, um, I was praying. And I was like, Lord, my mother was dead by that time. Um, and I prayed, like, Lord, one of these days, let me somehow locate my father. At least so he can know I, I churned out okay. I, I'm a Christian now. I'm, I'm going to be all right. You know? And this was in 1998. <laughs> And uh, my wife and I got married in 2005, so we're coming up on our 10th year anniversary, praise the Lord. And um, when we were courting in uh, 2004, she helped me to locate my father after 25 years of not knowing where he was. Um, I was 28 back then in uh, 2004. Um, and so he helped me, uh, she helped me locate him, and it was really providential because he was actually uh, on his deathbed. He was, is this thing still on? Did you guys turn it down? Okay. You guys can hear me still? He had, uh, he was a former, uh, he was a Vietnam veteran. Uh, he was drafted in 1966. Uh, he responded to the draft a year later, 1967. Excuse me, yes, 1967, and he was uh, in Vietnam for the year 1967, 1968, he was actually part of the Tet Offensive. Some of you know military history. But we lost a lot of our guys uh, during the Tet Offensive when the Viet Cong and the Chinese Army came back and counterattacked the Americans. And uh, a lot of people died. My father was a part of that. And so he got a heroin addiction over there in Vietnam. He actually had a, he picked up a heroin addiction when he was 15 in the streets of New York. He was born in the Bronx, uh, born and raised in the Bronx, New York. He was a New York. He was a New Yorkian. They call him. And uh, being in Vietnam and seeing a bunch of your buddies blown up didn't help his drug addiction. He ended up starting to medicate his mind by doing drugs. And when he got out of Vietnam, he continued the same lifestyle. Um, he was an intravenous drug user, and he caught uh, hepatitis C from dirty needles. So if you know what hepatitis C does, it destroys your liver. So by the time uh, my wife located him, the hepatitis C had gone to the point where uh, his liver was gone, he had ascites, it was just completely gone. And um, he was on a, on a waiting list for a liver transplant at the VA hospital up in Vancouver, Washington. And I located him. You know what's crazy? Is my wife 
was my back then my fiance. She was a former medical student at Loma Linda University. So she used to live in the apartments right around the corner from Loma Linda. And right next to Loma Linda is the VA hospital in Southern California. And my father was living in the apartments right there, right down the street from my, my wife. So when I used to go down and visit her, I used to drive right by the apartments he lived in for years without knowing he was there. <laughs> so she looked him up and went down, and it's a long story, but uh, she was able to finally go to the apartments. He wasn't there. He was up in Washington in the hospital on a, really his deathbed. And the apartment manager gave the phone number. He, she looked it up and called and located his room. Uh, and he was in a hotel in Portland because the VA was overflowed, so the VA was paying for a hotel room for him to stay in. And she called me and gave me the phone number. And I'll never forget the day. And uh, it was uh, wintertime in 2004, and I, got to, I was in a supermarket in the, in the cereal aisle with my little basket, uh, raising up my first church in the New York Conference back then. And she called me up and says, uh, I think I located your father. And here's the number. I said, no way. I said, okay, I'll call you back. And so I called up, and I was in the cereal aisle. And um, the lady answered. Though, actually, I called up, and they said, you know, hello, it's such and such hotel. I said, yeah, can I get the room such and such? Yes, they transferred me over. Ring. My heart started going to pitter pad. I can't believe this. The phone picked up. Hello, it was a woman's voice. Didn't know who it was. It was turned out it was his wife at the time, a girlfriend. Or so yes, is uh, Edward uh, Loriano there, please? So yeah, one moment. Oh, no way. And the phone picks up, and a high raspy voice sounds just like mine answers the phone. Hello. That sounds kind of a, like a familiar voice. <laughs> sounds like my voice. <laughs> is uh, Edward Loriano? Yeah. I said, did you uh, ever know a Holly Richards? Yeah. Do you have a son named Emiliano Loriano Richards? Yeah. I said, hi, Dad, I'm your son. Oh, no. Hey, everybody, it's, oh. And he started to cry and started to apologize and all these different things. It was really a very sweet reunion and, um, you know, he was on his deathbed, and he had been praying um, that he could locate his children before he died. I have two sisters. All three of us are from different mothers. And my younger sister grew up with him. Her name was Susanna Loriano. And uh, she knew my father. My older sister, Michelle, uh, Michelle Loriano, uh, she was raised in New York. And then she became a heroin addict, moved out to California. She was in and out of the California correctional system. Matter of fact, she was in prison when I saw my father. And, of course, my, my whole life, you know how that went. And... Uh, my sister, Michelle, was able to locate him using the Internet one year before I located him. So the final closure he really needed was just to be able to locate me. And here I am. I pop up the clear blue sky and say, hey, Dad, I'm your son. And so my wife and I got married uh, in uh, 2005, April 2005. And then right after we married our honeymoon, we flew from New York over to uh, Oregon. And we actually got to stay in the hotel with my father for uh, like a four-day, three, four-day weekend and did some treatments on him and did some juicing with him and... Just tried to encourage him, got to read the Bible for him, and, and just got to know my father, got to know my roots. And uh, that was the last time I ever saw him. So he died just a few months later. So my point is, is that, you know, it's important for us to know who we are, to know our roots, right? And I said that whole story to share that, you know, we, we are children of the king. And we have a very special spiritual heritage, and we need to know our roots. We need, to know, we, need to, we need to know the lineage that our Father has given us. And it's right here, brothers and sisters. Okay, we come from an unbroken line of true, faithful Sabbath keepers. Okay, how much time do I have so I can wrap this up? About 15 minutes? 15 is about 15, 15 minutes because it brings us to 5.30, right? And we'll close the Sabbath? Okay. Anybody learning a little something? If anything, you're learning about me a little bit more, aren't you? <laughs> like, I love this preacher. He's, he's so nice. All right. <laughs> Are we all together so far on this? Can I have your attention for 15 more minutes? Yes. You're not going to fall out on me, are you? No. All right, good. You know, when you're in the world, you should watch three-hour-long movies, so you're going to be okay. I'll give you a little bit of gospel. The charts come back into history, right? Then we come down to a disappointment. 
The spring of 1844 was a first disappointment where many Adventists fell away, right? Now, what other event comes up where many Adventists fall away? Let me go ahead and read the quote to you. And no, it's not what's happening in this church. I'm not, I'm not laughing about that. It's not that. Let me go ahead and read this to you. Great Controversy, page 608. Great Controversy, page 608. Write this down. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed the Lord Angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. Men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. Now, what is that talking about right there? What crisis is Mrs. White referring to in Great Controversy, page 608, where we're brought before courts and rulers and many of our brethren leave and start uh, accusing us when Sabbath keepers are brought to court when the storm comes. What is this issue? Sunday law crisis. That's what it is. Now tomorrow, by God's grace, I'll show you that the Sunday law crisis has a three-step testing process to it, okay? But for simplicity's sake, is this still loud enough for everybody? You all can still hear me okay? All right. For simplicity's sake, we put national Sunday law as the way mark when many people Testing one, okay, that's really loud. <laughs> Testing one, two. All right. I guess I'm so long-winded, I just wear out microphones and batteries, don't I? <laughs> okay. So the National Sunday Law brings a great disappointment to our people. You understand that, don't you? Now, I'm speaking from my heart in a very serious way, okay? So I'm not laughing about this. Do you all, are you all aware, is everyone here aware of the fact that not every professed Seventh-day Adventist is going to heaven. Do you all understand that? People say, oh, you're being judgmental. Brother, this is the facts. This is the facts, friends. 18 million Seventh-day Adventists, we're not all going to glory. We have all sorts of craziness going on in our church. All right? Here, are, here is the patience of the saints. The word saint means holy-fied, holy ones that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It's not keeping the Sabbath to go out and buy chicken on Saturday night and all this other stuff. It's not, it's not keeping this commandments of God to be lying and stealing and committing adultery and being in relationships you shouldn't be in. So we have to have the commandments of God written in our heart in the faith of Jesus Christ. You understand, friends? The seal of God in our mind, intellectual and spiritual, so that we cannot be moved. And our people need to understand this. I'm so thankful that there are certain ministries and faithful people in the churches that are still trying to do the work of the Lord and encourage our people. But friends, we have a real crisis going on in our denomination. Okay? And we have to be really blind to not be honest about that. You understand that, friends? Okay? Matter of fact, I've been talking with some former student people that are here at Oakwood. You know Oakwood University? I, and a matter of fact, I think we were just talking to some young people the other night. We were just very plain that there is open, rampant homosexuality taking place on the campus. Oh, yeah. No, not just in California. You guys know that? Open, rampant homosexuality taking place on the campus. These are young people that will come up and just, you know, confide in me like, you know, Pastor, this, these guys just, just come up and say, yeah, I swing both ways. And they have the broken wrist and everything else. You know what I'm talking about? This is, this, is, this is open rebellion against the God of heaven. We have some things that are going on that are really, really bad. Now, I'm not here to pick on the church and so forth, but just to be honest, that not all Seventh-day Adventists are going to heaven, okay? Remember, we're in a preparation time, are we not? We're in a preparation time where the virgins, we have to be getting the oil and experience in our vessels with our lamps, Right? All right, and friends, when the Sunday law is passed, every one of us, we're going to have to be tested of whether we're going to receive the seal of God and be loyal to God's commandments or receive the mark of the beast and be disloyal to God's commandments when we're tested. Is that not the facts? Now, at a, when a Sunday law is passed, who do you think is going to be tested first? It's us who know 
that Sabbath is Sabbath, God's day and Sunday is the mark of the beast. We're the ones that are tested first, right? Now, the point is, is that here, <clears throat> it is not in a crisis that you gain strength. It is a, a crisis that reveals your character. In other words, what I'm trying to say is when the crisis comes, that's not time to say, okay, Lord, now I'm really going to get ready. Now I'll get serious, Lord. You know, you hear a lot of that, don't you? <clears throat> here's, a little, here's a little secret I, I tell people all the time. If you want to know what you're going to be like five years from now, you're going to be just the way you are except worse. Or you're going to be just the way you are except better. In other words, it's day by day as a sanctification process. It's day by day we surrender our will to God. It's a bundle of choices. When you wake up in the morning and you have your worship and devotion, you surrender your heart to Christ, you have choices that day whether you will abide in Christ or you will come out of Christ. And every day is different. That's why we need Jesus. We need the Word of God. And so as we're walking through temptations will come. Maybe somebody says something wrong. We're tempted to be maybe frustrated, but we don't have to yield to that sin. We can resist the devil. He'll flee from us. And if we have the victory over that, brothers and sisters, that is Christ in us, the hope of glory being formed. All right? If we fall, we say something we shouldn't, or we do something we shouldn't, we need to flee to the foot of the cross and confess that sin. Because if we die with that sin unconfessed, the wages of sin, singular, is death, friends. And that's why Jesus is so merciful. He's allowing us to live so long. Because he's asking, he's, he's trying to be able to help us to have that experience of not just justification, but also the sanctified walk. We're learning to abide in Christ. All right? Does that make sense, friends? All right. And I, if I have more time, I deal with that more. But the Sunday law is the time where the test will come to each of us individually. Will you, my sister, will you, my brother, will you be loyal to God's commandments or to the traditions of man? Will you be loyal to the beast power or to the God of heaven? And each of us individually will be tested. Are you with me, friends? And many people we just learned, when the storm approaches, a large class will fall away and end up becoming our most bitter persecutors when Sabbath keepers are brought before courts and rulers and kings. So there's a great disappointment. However, there's good news. It's not all just gloom and doom. The good news is that there will be wise virgins. There will be people that right now are developing a Christ-like character. They're putting oil in their vessels with their lamps. There are people right now that are having this experience. Day by day, higher and higher, holier and holier, reflecting Jesus more and more, looking away from self and looking to Christ. Are you with me, friends? The day by day surrender, friends. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn. It's perfect at every stage, but there is a growth and development. Until all the fruits are manifest under the latter rain, and then the Lord will come and harvest them. Are you with me, friends? And so the people that refuse that preparation, they're going to receive the mark of the beast. But the people that have the preparation within our, within our church, they will go forward and give what? The loud cry. And guess what, friends? It's a parallel. Back here was the second angel Come out of my people, Babylon. 50,000 people left the churches, right? Here you're going to have, not the second, but the fourth. And what does the fourth angel say? Same thing, doesn't it? That when the fourth is empowered, in Revelation 8, verse 4, it's also come out of my people. Come out of Babylon. That's the final loud cry. And then there's a shut door, which parallels another shut door. When Michael stands up. All right, did you get that? I want to read a quotation very quickly, and we're going to go ahead and uh, start to wind this down. I'm hoping that all this, by God's grace, made sense to you. Does it make sense? Here's a quotation. I just want to show you, because there's been a question as to, uh, does Ellen White liken, because uh, we already know what the Bible teaches, Right? The Bible itself says the second angel's message, Revelation 14, verse 8, is Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Revelation 18, verse 2, the fourth angel is Babylon has fallen, has fallen. So we already know what the Bible says, that the second and the fourth angel parallel, right? An additional witness to this is also early writings, page 277. And Mrs. White is dealing with the fact that the midnight cry parallels the loud cry. Angels were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven, and I heard voices which seemed to sound everywhere come out of her, my people, 
that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. This message seemed to be an addition to the third message, joining it as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message in 1844. Did you get that? The glory of God rested upon the patient waiting saints and they fearlessly gave the last solemn warning proclaiming the fall of Babylon and calling upon God's people to come out of her that they might escape her fearful doom. So right there, the pen of inspiration also locates the fact that the fourth angels joining the third angel's message come out of Babylon just like the midnight cry joined the second angel's message come out of Babylon. You get it? There's a clear parallel in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Um, and... What's that? It's early writings, page 277. Early writings, page 277. All right, now, I think I should probably wrap up somewhere around here. Um, I was going to try to show a, uh, I don't want to confuse anybody, though. I was going to show a contrasting line, um, but maybe I should just leave it like that. <laughs> well, you think I should show it? The contrasting thing, or just leave it alone? All right, good. Leave, it's like, leave it alone. Don't confuse me. All right. So did you, did you see how the history parallels itself? So this whole series has been called the message, the experience, and the events of the third angel. The message, beast, mark, image, Daniel 11, 40 to 45. When we understand that message, we can also understand the events, right? From 1989 to 2001, to the Sunday law, to the loud cry, to when Michael stands up and Jesus comes a second time. We understand the message. We understand the events. We need the experience. And that's my prayer for each and every one of you, that we can have the experience that Jesus wants us to have. Amen? We'll close with that, with the word of prayer. Let us go ahead and pray and close. And we'll come back tomorrow morning, friends, to pick it up and we talk a little bit more about prophecy. Amen? But let's ask the Lord to seal the things we've understood in our minds, and to give us this experience that can couple the message. Let us pray. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you've helped to make the, the basic line of history clear to us today as we've understood the events of the third angel. We understand the message of the third angel and how it's leading us to a great final crisis between the commandments of God and the traditions of men. But Lord, we need the experience. And we need the experience now. The difference between the wise virgins and the foolish virgins was that one had oil before the midnight cry, before the crisis, and the other class was neglecting the preparation of the oil. When the crisis came, they all woke up. And Lord, to be honest, we're all here asleep. Because in our minds we know these things, but Lord, in our hearts, oftentimes we live in different ways that are not truly professing that we believe you're coming. And by our lifestyle, we're saying that our Lord delays his coming. And I pray that you'd forgive us. We desire and choose to repent by your grace as you give us that gift even now. We pray for a personal revival, and I pray for personal conviction and conversion to be in the hearts and minds of every precious soul watching this, that you would give us your grace <clears throat> to overcome sin, that we would confess and forsake it, that it may be blotted out in the times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. And we pray that you would help us be ready for this stupendous crisis that is soon to overwhelm us. And Lord, rather than being swept away by the soon coming storm, please help us to be among those that will rise up and warn the world and give them an explanation for what's happening. That they may flee to the refuge, a stronghold for hope. Please bless your precious children, Lord. And what I mean by blessing them, I don't, I don't pray that you will bless them in sin. I pray that you will bless them with conviction and conversion. I don't necessarily pray that you will bless their finances, but I pray that you will bless their marriages and their children with conversion. I don't pray for them to have fancy houses. I pray for them to have a mansion in heaven. And I pray, Father, that your face would bless them as they turn to you. We thank you for the Sabbath hours. 
And as the sun has now set, we also want to officially just say thank you for the sacred hours and the wonderful day you've given us. And I pray that you seal this experience in our hearts and bring us through this new week in victory. So be with us now as we have our closing announcements and wind down and prepare to dismiss. And grant us your peace is our prayer, Holy Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.